congratulations on this new film, Big Easy Queens. Uh, thank thank you, so you so much. Thank you. Hey, more of a congratulations is being showcased at what the Austin Gay and Lesbian International Film Festival. Well, that was a mouthful for my. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 How, how, how do you two feel about this? We're so excited. I mean, you, you spend so much time kind of in your own little bubble getting it finished that like when you finally get to like show your baby to the world, you you don't know what to expect. So, I mean, I feel like the, the train is rolling and yeah. it's been really fun so far. I mean, we like it. So we hope yeah. others do. You know, that's, that's sort of the risk you take. <laughs> Most excellent. Well, let, let me ask the uh, obligatory uh, question that uh, we always ask is, uh, what initially drew you to this uh, project? I'll, I'll start with Aaron first. Go for it. Uh, so actually, it, it started with Eric. Um, Eric brought the project to me. We we met kind of accidentally and just started chatting about art and told him I was a film director. And, you know, little did I know that he had a little like script in his back pocket that he'd been maybe thinking about getting done and just kind of took that as a sign. And next thing I knew he and uh, our writer, Robert Lelou were inviting me to dinner and plying me with wine and <laughs> asking if I might be interested in coming on board and really pitching me this amazing project that sounded like something I'd never heard of before, which, which of course enticed me. Well then Eric, tell, tell us about uh, this script. I mean, um, that, uh, that Robert wrote here. So um, just before that, uh, uh, so uh, Robert had interviewed to write a, a script for another network and he didn't get the gig and he sort of, you know, as writers do came out as, you know, as happy as he could be. And he sort of poured himself a glass of wine and he said, you could do a movie. Miss Bouvier could do a movie. And I just thought he was absolutely crazy. <laughs> and he actually had this story that he had worked out. And the next day is when I met Aaron. Yeah. Uh, and it just sort of felt like the stars were aligning and it was kismet. It was meant to be. And um, two weeks later or three weeks later, we took her out to dinner and had a fleshed out long line and and then a script and and then the rest is as they say history so he called it i, I have to i i have robert to thank and blame <laughs> <laughs> in all the right ways wow and and eric how, how how does it feel that you know robert wrote an entire story revolving around the character that you created um well, uh, truthfully, Miss Bouvier was created with Robert's blessing um, back in March of 2020, just before the, the world pandemic shut down. Um, so he was very familiar with my verse, the Southern aspect of it, and how I sort of speak and the assertiveness and, and the, the accessibility I wanted her to have. It's almost a Dame Edna accessibility where she can be a little innuendo, but she's not overtly what I would say raunchy in, in that way. Um, so he knew I wanted to retain those aspects. He really was my voice. So um, when he said I should do a movie, I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't know he was going to write it the way he did. Um, and I, of course, when I read the script and I see Miss Bouvier, Miss Bouvier, Miss Bouvier, I'm like, yes, I have all these lines. And then when you go to film, you're like, dang it, I have all these lines. <laughs> I, okay, I have much more to do than I bargained for. But um, I, again, I just, I have him to thank. He really, he he is the voice. He is the motivation and, and a dear friend of mine. And I, you know, we can't wait to work with him again. Wow. Aaron, how did you want to approach uh, something like this? Because, you know, it has has music, it has comedy, but, you know, when, like, right off the start, I almost thought this was a horror movie. Yeah, I mean, well, look, I'm a horror director. I, I have a horror theater. I do live horror productions here in Miami um, and parlay that into a film career. And, and so that was part of the discussion that we were having is, well, guys, if you want me to direct this, we're going to have to make sure that the horror is really there because that's just kind of my brand. Right. So um, thankfully Robert and Eric were both like, yeah, let's, let's bolster that up. Let's make sure you get the blood in there that you want. Let's, and, and, you know, truth be told, I think there's, there's such a great audience out there that are, that is a horror audience that would want something like this. I mean, it really is different. And, and traditionally, you know, horror audiences are the rebels of cinema 
And this film is pretty rebellious. It's very yeah. different. So it, it just really fit. And I think horror is in in, in a lot of ways innately queer. Uh, it goes against the grain. It, it is not normative. There, like you said, mm -hmm. there's sort of the rebels in film. And it, it just makes a lot of sense to have a queer element to it. And then when we said, can we add musical numbers? I mean, she was like, listen, I can do gore, I can do glam, let's do it. And, yeah. you know, Rocky Horror Picture Show is probably the most famous version of uh, ver type of film in this genre that we're trying to sort of follow in and, and honor. And that is what we sort of set our eyes on is to catch that audience, that sort of camp audience that's multi-generational. It can translate whether you're queer or you're straight, male, female, whatever it is, it will appeal to you. I think that with, with a targeted audience, I don't want to say we just threw, you know, spaghetti at the wall and hope something stuck. Yeah. We gave this some sincere thought and paid homage to things like Die, Mommy, Die, Mommy, Dearest. John Rocky Waters. Rocky show, John yeah. Waters. You know, we yeah. really strategically laced those things in there and, and really hope that the audiences that come catch that. Now, I, I do want to have a little discussion about, uh, you know, this uh, queer horror subgenre um, itself. You're right. Rocky Horror Picture Show is something that a lot of people traditionally love every every Halloween. And as of as of late in the past few years, there is more and more queer horror films that are coming out. I mean, talk talk about this trend and what is the lure of this uh, subgenre or do you consider it as a subgenre? I think it's becoming less a subgenre now. I think it really is just part of the genre. I mean, so many horror movies you go out to see uh, really just has, includes queer characters at this point. Um, Knock at the Cabin was one example um, where, you know, the, the main protagonists were uh, a gay couple with kids. So I think it's just becoming very normalized and mainstream, which is which is great. And I think, you know, we took it a little level further by, you know, having drag queens, which is not something that you would normally see uh, in a horror film. But, you know, we tried to, again, keep it agenda free. You know, we just wanted it to be a fun story that featured drag queens and not even mention the fact that we, that they're drag queens. These are just characters in a film. So I, I think we, you know, again, put a lot of thought into that and also looked at where the genre was going, you know, when we were pitching investors on something like this, you know, we had a lot of comparables, like here is where horror is today with queer cinema included. And those films are doing really well out there. Yeah, I think the, I want to say the weekend we actually pitched and the M. Night uh, Shyamalan movie had just, Knock, at the, cabin. Knock yeah. at the Cabin had just recouped in a weekend. And so it was worth showing like, here's a queer horror film that had a multi-million dollar budget and recouped in its opening weekend. Now that was a theatrical release and obviously indie films usually have a different path, but it was a good sort of test. And also, by the way, we're showing these numbers in a climate in Florida where our governor is making drag queens illegal and don't say gay is now coming on. So our producers were motivated to show that that legislation is not representative of the state right. of Florida, that beautiful works of art that can show working and beautiful people can come from this state. Most excellent. And Eric, I, I understand this is your your debut on, on screen. How is that overall experience and how did you transition, I think what would, from, from stage to screen for yourself? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm sure I'll have a different answer in 10 years from now, but right now I'm very proud of it. When I look <laughs> back, I don't know, but we'll see. Uh, no, I'm very, very proud of it because, you know, and, and Aaron, I, I've said this time and time again, Aaron speaks film and theater. And so having a director who can navigate theater actors and sort of speak our vernacular and speak our language to, to get what she needs to get it on camera really made the world of a difference. I mean, it, I don't envision that it would have been as easy as a process with as many, I mean, Jennifer McLean's a Broadway baby. Ben Chavez, who plays Mimi, is a tap dancing queen. We're all theater people. Mm -hmm. And I was just terrified because, you know, theater people so notoriously, you know, get reviews that say, you know, oh, it's clearly she's theater. They were too big for screen, you know. So it was my nightmare. I was having like, I just couldn't sleep. And she really just navigated that and just had, you know, her, her translator 
right there, always on. And, and, and she was able to really teach us in a safe space. And that was yeah. just key. Wow. That's amazing. Aaron, how, how do you approach, um, you know, a film like this, you know, you're trying to make something on screen, but working with theater people. Rehearsals. I, I mean, I really wanted everyone to feel 100% prepared when they walked on set, because the minute you walk on set, there's the cameras and the sound people and the lights and everything. And it can become very intimidating um, because a lot of the times it doesn't, it, when you're on set, it's not about the performance for the people around them anymore. The, the crew, the director, you know, so much of it is focused on the technical aspects of it that, you know, you don't always have time to like fully direct those actors in, you know, on a 14 hour day when you're just rushing, 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 trying to get something done. So I just wanted to make sure with lots of rehearsals beforehand that everybody felt comfortable, everybody knew uh, what they were going to be doing, how big, how small, what framing we're probably looking at for each scene. Um, and that said, you know, I really did my best to communicate with them on set too and make sure that they had all the feedback they needed to know that, you know, they're doing the job the way I wanted them to. Um, so I, I think preparation is key. Being from theater as well, I can't imagine walking on set with people who I haven't rehearsed with. I just think that's so important. And I know that that's a a luxury with film sometimes. I know a lot of times film actors don't get that with their director and that was important. Which blows us. my mind. Yeah. I can't imagine yeah. going into like, no theater rehearsals. What? So yeah, that when she told me that, I mean, we really did count our blessings that we all gave up time beforehand and committed to this in a level of, of, of rehearsal to make sure that when we got there, it was work time, not rehearse time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the commitment actually shows, but I ha I have to address the music. The music was lovely and fabulous here. Uh, tell us about the development of the music. And Eric, did you contribute to that music? Yeah, so um, Adam Michael Tilford, uh, who wrote three of the four songs you hear in the film, um, he had written uh, the finale song, Under the Influence of You, many years ago. And there's a YouTube video of his husband singing it. He's, he works in New York. He's a fabulous musician in New York. And um, Jennifer, who plays Poodles, uh, knows him. And I was looking for a composer and she played me that song. And I was like, that is the style of the music I want. So we called them up and uh, we worked on what types of music we needed it to accomplish and what kind of narrative position it was. And I'm telling you, the first draft of both songs are the songs you hear. He's that good. He was so incredible and so kind and giving. And and then Matthew Darren, who plays Jackson, wasn't originally in the film. And when he finally came on, Matthew is an incredible singer. And I was like, there's no way we're going to have him in this film and not have him sing. So he wrote that song the night before, like, like yeah. literally 24 hours before he had to film it and be memorized and do the song. And that's speaks to his talent. Yeah. So, you know, he wrote that song, um, uh, Steal Away. And uh, I mean, when you have somebody who writes music for you, I mean, I was just like, what is my life right now? Yeah, what is, yeah. this is happening. Oh and he, God. and Matthew produced. And produced all the music, all yeah, the music in his yeah. studio. So when we recorded it, um, that was his original position was our music producer. And uh, so I was in his studio recording all these songs and already working with him. Uh, it just made sense, you know, it, I mean, when you hear him sing, how do you not swoon? Yep. <laughs> well, Eric, you have such a lovely voice. And Aaron, I, I wasn't sure, have you worked with, uh, you know, like musical acts like this before? I have, right. So, uh, you know, I've done theater as a director for 10 plus years. So, yeah, I've had the, the you know, I've been able to work on musicals before, more on the horror side of things, but still musicals. Uh, so I, I understood that world as well. Um, but it, like I said, it, it really is the perfect merging of all of these talents because we all were very aligned with our experience. And, um, you know, even though I've done film and, and most of the others hadn't, we were all still coming from the same place and the same. Mm -hmm. With the same goal. Same goals. So it, it was it was an easy transition to do. It was a little scary, right? Like doing a movie musical isn't like a small thing, right? It's hard <laughs> enough to do a, mu a movie and then you're adding music on top of it. 
Uh, it's it's a little intimidating, but we I, did say movie, and then when we said musical, she said more wine, please, <laughs> <laughs> at the pitch okay. because she's not wrong. I mean, it, it that adds two, four months onto your production because you yeah. gotta record the music beforehand. You have to choreograph it, you have to light it. You have, there's well and so then and then more. editing editing, editing the musical music, numbers. Getting orchestrations. Yeah. There's just I mean yeah. it adds, it's an entire own production on its own. <laughs> so but I mean but we did the it. Master, Bring it on, it. right? She we did, did it. it. There it is. You, you did you did do it. <laughs> <laughs> And Eric, I have to ask a drag question because I know I do know that this is an indie project. From from costumes to hair to makeup, is that all you? Absolutely not. It is Dan Gagnon, and I have to say that I worship the ground he works on and walks on because he, Dan Gagnon, uh, has been a longtime stylist of mine. Um, I have zero talent when it comes to sewing, when it comes to making a wig. I'm talking talentless heck. <laughs> shit at it excuse me for the word but that's the only description i can give you but he uh, i hired him uh when i was living in michigan uh and uh we've been friends ever since and he sort of i call him my bob mackie he is and he takes inspiration from that he takes inspiration from new designers um but it i begged and pleaded with him to come on this film and he not only did my costumes and my hair, but he did poodles and he did Mimi. He did everyone. So um, that is all Dan Gagnon. Yeah. Well, most excellent. And Aaron, I just want to throw out one last question. And this is always a debatable thing in the horror okay. genre. Uh -huh. Practical versus, you know, visual effects. Tell us about your approach and your opinion on this debate. Look, I am I am an 80s horror fan. That's when I grew up. I grew up in the 80s with, you know, Tom Savini, you know, master of practical effects, Rob Botton, Rick Baker. Like, these are the kings of practical visual effects in horror movies. Um, I am 100% a practical effects girl. As much as I could possibly make it happen on the budget that we had, I was going to do it. We had two amazing special effects artists, Mike Maloney and uh, Jacko Blackwell. And that is what they do. They do prosthetics. They do the blood. Um, everything that you saw there, they did. Um, we did use a little bit of CGI just to fill in some of the gaps of like, you know, we want the blood spurt to be a little thicker in places. Um, but that was very few, few and far between. Yeah, I mean, like maybe. the stitching of the lips, we put... Um, Jennifer McLean in a full face cast to, you know, cast her face. You know, she had little straws up her nose so she could breathe. Um, Two which, hours or which something. Which was like not that. like a small ask because she's yeah. actually claustrophobic. Terribly claustrophobic. Um, but, she's you know, terrible. we had the mold of her face made so we could like really like look like we're sewing those lips. And we did that, you know, live on camera. Uh, so that to me, again, being from the 80s, I'm, I'm a practical effects girl, 100%. Well, this is a wonderful movie, Big Easy Queens. I enjoyed this conversation. I enjoyed the movie. and uh, Thank you. And Thank hopefully you. someday I'll, I'll make it to the East Coast out, out where you, um, you are, Eric, and watch a show or something. I mean, this, please. this is terrific. Yes. Amazing. Please, 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 please. Thank you so much for your time. Hey, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Bye now. Okay. Bye. Thank